Welcome to the third chapter of mobile communications. In this chapter I will cover the medium access. Medium access is very important because the spectrum, the frequencies we can use, as you saw from the table for example in the first chapter, is really a scarce resource. So if many people want to access for example a mobile telecommunication network, it might be simply crowded we will have an overloaded system and maybe you cannot use the system at all. So this is one reason why we have to have different medium access schemes. In this chapter, I will show you how we use the multiplexing technologies from chapter two, add an algorithm which will result in our multiple access schemes. I will talk a bit about the schemes we use in fixed networks and then I will show you what we do in wireless scenarios. Okay, coming back to fixed networks, why don't we simply use the schemes we know from fixed networks? In computer networking, well, I talked about the classical scheme, the legacy scheme from Ethernet, the CSMA CD scheme carrier sensing, multiple access with collision detection. What does it mean? Well, if you have in the example of Ethernet, a wire, that means you have a start nach wire. That means you have a certain medium and you attach your computers to this medium. So that's the classical setting of a bus topology in classical Ethernet, IEEE 802.3. Then the carrier sensing works as follows. You listen into the medium before you send. Sometimes it's also called listen before talk. Good idea for discussions. So you listen to the medium. If the medium is idle, you can start sending. Sending, that means, well, your signals propagate along the wire or the coax cable. But still, while sending, you continue to listen into the medium. Why? Because if, for example, someone else also started sending, now imagine two stations start basically at the same time, then we will have a collision. This collision will propagate along the wire and you as a sender will also hear this collision. That's the idea of collision detection. So CSMA CD is a classical scheme from fixed networks. So now why does it work here? We have a wire, a wire of a limited length and within this limited length, the signals are strong enough so that you can still hear the collision. But in wireless systems, we have some problems. And I will explain these problems in some more detail on the next slide. The problem here is that the signal strength decreases quite drastically. So, square of the distance in vacuum, yes. But we learned if we have obstacles, etc. in between, it's even more. And the main problem now is, remember this, the sender applies carrier sensing and collision detection, but the problem now is that the collisions happen at the receiver. In our fixed network, that's not a problem. So if we have this collision somewhere, the collision propagates to all the receivers, but also to the sender. So everyone hears this collision. But maybe in wireless networks, the sender cannot hear, receive the collision. So collision detection does not work. And I will show you an example where carrier sensing doesn't work. Then we call a terminal a hidden terminal. Okay, in some more detail. Let's assume the following setting. We have a sender A and a sender C and somewhere in between a receiver B. Shown here, 
on the y-axis is the signal strength and you will also see there's a certain threshold if the signal value is below the threshold i cannot detect it it it's, appears as noise remember transmission ranges interference range etc let's assume in the simplified example if the signal is stronger than the threshold I can receive the signal I can receive the data so now what happens if sender a sends something you see this decrease of the signal strength the further away you are from the sender the weaker the signal is okay so now and sooner or later the signal strength will be below the threshold that means there's a certain area around the sender, our transmission range, where the signal is okay. So in this example, receiver B can easily not only detect the signal, but receive data. Okay, nice. But for, for the sender C, the green signal is nothing but noise. So sender A adds some noise. To the already existing noise floor and something similar is quite true for sender c if c starts sending or you have this strong decrease of the signal strength and for a sender c will just add some noise but for b the signal of c is fine so the signal is okay for the receiver B, both signals, signal from A and signal from C. Now let's assume both senders apply CSMA CD, the classical screen from fixed networks. What happens? If sender A starts sending, well, that's nice, but for C, for C, that's nothing but noise. So, C could simply say, hey, there is some noise, but no one else is sending. So why not start sending my signal? Okay. Uh-huh. Is this a good idea? Okay, let's start sending. Fine. What happens now? At the receiver B, both signals overlap they also overlap at center a they also overlap at center c but the signals of the other sender are simply too weak you cannot detect them they're nothing but noise but at receiver b now there will be a collision that means there's strong interference between the red and the green signal the signal from C and from A and due to the interference receiver B will not receive any useful data it will see, receive some whatever zeros and ones maybe nothing at all so the interference is too strong hmm. so we already saw carrier sensing does not work but what about collision detection hmm now Collision detection, that means a sender continues to listen into the medium to detect the collision. Ah, we, we, we do have a collision here. But what happens with the collision? Okay, so the signal, the red signal, will put some interference, you see, also on the green signal. So if I add this, there might be some of the red signal on top of the green signal. But to be honest, at the location of sender A, here somewhere, well, you will not really hear anything about the red signal. This is just some noise there. Yes, there's always noise. So you cannot really perform collision detection because the collision, where you really can detect the collision, that's somewhere around receiver B, but not at the sender A and vice versa also not at the sender C. So collision detection also 
fails. So that means CSMACD simply does not really work in wireless communication scenarios because of this dramatic decrease of the signal strength. The signal strength decreases also in a copper wire. There's also attenuation, but in copper wires, we have a maximum cable length. In wireless communication, hmm, have you ever seen some circles around a hot spot drawn somewhere on the ground? Okay, do not step beyond this because this is the limit of the transmission range. Additionally, as you learned in the previous chapters, well, these ranges, they vary over time because maybe there's some more water in the air or there's some reflection or you're moving, etc. So that's very difficult to say. This is precisely a transmission range around a certain center. Okay, what is the effect of this problem? Well, we will have something that is called hidden or exposed terminals. Okay, so back to this setting, we have the senders and receivers A, B and C shown here with these classical mobile phones. And now just to make it simpler, this example, I only show a kind of a, uh, well, circle or sphere around the sender in this kind of an ideal world and only, let's say, the transmission range. And everything that's outside the circle, there's only noise and inside it's perfect transmission. So same setting. And the problem now is when A sends something to B, that was exactly the setting, C will not receive anything from A. So, and now if C wants to send something to B, B, well, following the carrier sensing idea, we sense the medium when it's idle. Nothing's going on. There's some noise, but that's it. So that means, okay, I can start sending. And now we have the problem of the collision here. Okay. Furthermore, we do not, as I just showed you, we do not receive the collision. So not only carrier sensing fails, but also collision detection. And then we call the terminal A as a hidden terminal, hidden for C, and vice versa, C is hidden for A. So A does not see the terminal C, and terminal C does not see the terminal A. So that's one of the problems. Hmm. Okay, so that's already a big problem, a hidden terminal. What else can we do? Well, let's assume C wants to send something to whatever other station. Okay, maybe C wants to send something to a D. Okay, D should be here within this transmission range. So that should be D and B wants to send something to A. Then we run into another problem. This problem is called exposed terminals. What happens? B sends to A. Great. C wants to send to whatever terminal, not A and B, but some D. The problem now is if C applies carrier sensing and checks is the medium idle, no, it's not, because C also receives the signals B wants to send to A. Well, we have antennas. And if we do not use directed antennas, but let's assume now kind of omnidirectional antennas, C will also receive the signals of B, as indicated here with this red sphere you like it in 3d for example okay so you can think of a sphere here for example okay now if we use carrier sensing that means the sender c has to wait because carrier sensing says wait 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 the medium is in use 
But to be honest, why should C wait? A is outside the range of C. So even if C sends at the same time, the signals will might reach this point and hopefully D, but then the signals are too weak. They will simply add as noise to the background and A will receive some noise plus a nice signal of B. So A is outside the radio range and this means waiting is not necessary. And then we say C is exposed to B because C has to wait. But waiting here doesn't make any sense. Okay, so the first set of problems. Well, we have another problem. The problem here is called near and far terminals. Think back of the wire. In wires, we do not really care. Yes, there might be stations closer to you and some other stations further away in a certain setting. Okay, but as we limit the length of the wire, we also can basically assure a certain signal strength. That means all the signals are more or less of the same strength, roughly. Here in a wireless setting, oh, the signal strength decreases proportional to the square of distance in vacuum, even worse, here on Earth's surface. That means, for example, that a signal of a device closer to you, let's assume B is closer to C compared to A, and this signal of B will simply drown out A signal, with the result that C cannot receive A. Classical example, if you have a room, many people in the room and someone is closer to you and asks you something, you can easily understand this person. But if someone else is at the far end of the room and asks with the same signal strength, then it might be difficult for you to understand because of the noise in the room. And if there's more noise, then the person closer to you can simply send with more output power, louder, but there's a certain limit. And for the person further away, there's also the same limit, but this person is further away. No chance to win. Think back of CDMA and breathing cells in the last chapter. So now let's assume C is kind of an arbiter for sending rights, and B always say, yeah, 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 I want to send, I want to send, I want to send then B can easily drown out terminal A, already on the physical layer. C will not receive anything from A. And this is why we need, especially in CDMA networks, precise power control. To assure that the signals reach C, in this case, more or less at the same signal strength. So B has to send with less output power, and A with more output power. That's the basic idea. Okay, so now you saw some problems. Hidden terminals, exposed terminals, near and far terminals. Okay, these are the effects of wireless transmission we have to live with. Now let's come back to our medium access schemes. Hmm, how does this work? Well, the basic idea of the medium access schemes are as follows. Let's start from the bottom of the slide. We use the multiplexing schemes we know so far. We add an algorithm and voila, we have a multiple access method. What does it mean? We know space division multiplexing. Now we can go to space division multiple access by segmenting space into sectors. We can use directed antennas, for example. We can set up cell structure. So the algorithm would be, for example, some authority 
telling you, okay, this is where you can place your base station or a network operator placing base stations or some intelligent algorithm performing this beam forming with directed antennas. We can use frequency division multiplexing at the algorithm and then we have frequency division multiple access. So for example, someone can assign certain frequencies to transmission channels. So maybe a authority assigns frequencies, a part of the spectrum to a radio station. This could be permanent, like for the radio broadcast. This could be some slow hopping, fast hopping scheme, whatever. This can be dynamic, more static. Something similar we can do with time. So we use our time division multiplexing, add an algorithm, then we have time division multiple access. So we assign a certain frequency to a channel, but only for a limited amount of time. So for some seconds, you will get a certain frequency or for some milliseconds or microseconds or whatever it is, 10 milliseconds, 400 microseconds or whatever. So we chop time into smaller slots and assign the slots to certain channels. And the way how we do it, that's our algorithm. And then we can do something also with polarization. We can assign a certain polarization to a transmission channel based, for, for example, using specialized antennas. So you can look back to the multiplexing schemes in chapter two. Then we add some algorithm, algorithm that could comprise computers, but also humans could be static, could be dynamic. We will see examples for this. So multiplexing plus algorithm and then we have our multiple access method. Okay, to give you some examples, very simple examples, maybe also some what more complex examples. A very simple example on the right hand side, you see the different channels for a classical GSM mobile phone system. Second generation classical system operating around 900 and something megahertz. So first of all, if we look at this figure, we see, okay, two times 124 channels. So this is a channel and we can now use these channels. So where do we now apply our multiple access scheme? Oh, many different ways. We separate, for example, the direction to different frequencies or set of frequencies. So a part of these channels are used for the uplink. Uplink, that means the link from the mobile phone to the base station. And another part we use for the downlink. So this separation was done by some standardization authority organization by, by some regulating authority. They say, okay, we have something that is called a paired band because we have a pair of bands, a paired bands with an uplink and a downlink spectrum. And if we do this, this is called frequency division duplex, FDD. So we use FDM for separating the uplink and the downlink. Okay, that's the first way of separating. And then we can also apply frequency division multiplexing by splitting the channels. For example, take for half of the channels for uplink and half for the downlink and say, okay, this is one operator. Now one example, this could go to T-Mobile and the other part could go to Vodafone. Okay, so this, this could be an example. So that some authority says, okay, how much do you pay? This and that millions of euros, dollars, whatever. Then you will get a part of the spectrum. 
And within this spectrum now, the network operator can say, okay, and now I have 64 channels, 64 in the uplink, 64 in downlink. And now I can assign these channels to my cells. So now the operator basically said, okay, for this base station, a bit more traffic, maybe five channels for this, less traffic, three channels or 10 channels and five channels or whatever, depending on the expected load, because the more channels you have, the more subscribers you can have within the cell. So you can further subdivide the spectrum into these channels and then assign them to certain cells. So the algorithm would be inside the network operator, for example, or some authority. Or if then the mobile phones apply some hopping between the channels, we have a FDMA scheme inside the mobile phone. So you see already from this very simple example, very, very simple, but different entities actually perform this algorithm for the multiple axes. And as we will see, inside each of the channels, we can then additionally apply time division multiplexing. So those schemes are not exclusive. You can combine them. That's just one example where we use the FDM twice as FDD, separate the direction, and FDMA to separate operators, different channels, to separate different cells in the network. Okay, if you thought, oh, this is already complex, no, this was the simple example. If we look at systems of today, we use frequency division multiplexing in a even more clever scheme. Okay, and by the way, I should not forget the E here for the Vodafone. And just as a side remark, the E here is a funny thing because in German, it was in former times written without the E, which means the same in German, but to sound a bit more international, the E was added. Okay, so Vodafone T-Mobile. Okay, what is the a bit more complex example? Well, this is called OFDMA, Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access. And you can already imagine, oh my, what is this? So, first of all, what is the basic idea? The basic idea of OFDM is using O of OFDMA is using OFDM. Okay, that does not really help. What does it mean? You use a scheme, I will explain it, OFDM for multiple access. But what is OFDM? So again, without going into electrical engineering details, this is a course for computer scientists, OFDM, the simple way. So in OFDM, you separate the spectrum into many so-called sub carriers so smaller parts of the spectrum in the figure here you see our spectrum okay and instead of having one wider channel per user we now split up this spectrum into small 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 so-called sub carriers but, and this is the interesting part, those subcarriers overlap. Okay, so they overlap. And the interesting thing is, but this is then something really for electrical engineering, you can now use, for example, instead of one wider channel for your bits you want to transmit, a set of smaller subcarriers. Instead of sending one stream with a high symbol rate, remember modulation, many symbols per second, you split up this high symbol rate into multiple streams 
of low simple rate. And then you transmit this lower simple sequence of symbols via these subcarriers, multiple subcarriers. That's the basic idea. So multiple closely spaced subcarriers, overlapping spectra, and you transmit data in parallel. So that's the classical scheme used in digital video and audio broadcasting. But also, if you have a closer look, for example, in your DSL router, you look up the DSL spectrum in the router, you will find something that looks like, whoa, many subcarriers, sometimes also called tones, multi-tone. But that's the same. Basic idea is exactly the same. So in DSL, we also use many subcarriers thousands of subcarriers if we want to transmit these high data rates, 100, 200 megabits per second over these old, old telephone lines. But also wireless LAN uses this, 802.11a, classical system. So the idea in the classical OFDM is that we use multiple subcarriers and each subcarrier transmit a lower simple rate, fewer symbols per second compared to one wider channel with a higher simple rate. Now, what do we do for OFDMA? Well, we use it for multiplexes. So we assign subcarriers, a set of subcarriers to individual users for a certain time. What does it mean? Well, we combine FDM and TDM. The figure shows a user green and a user orange, yellow, and a user red and a user blue. And at a certain point in time, it might look like this pattern here, that green gets a certain number of subcarriers here. Altogether, we have six subcarriers for green and red will get five subcarriers yellow, also five subcarriers, and blue, five subcarriers. So that means, assuming same modulation, same symbol rate, that maybe blue has a lower data rate compared to green. Green needs more resources. What does resource mean? Well, the number of subcarriers for a certain amount of time. So in the next second, this pattern could look completely different. I will come back to this scheme when I explain LTE because LTE and all the newer so-called radios, new radios, so the new transceivers for the fifth generation, sixth generation, whatever, but also wireless LANs following 802.11ax, they use this together with MIMO technology. They like each other, OFDMA and MIMO. So they go well together. They use exactly an OFDM scheme, but now they rearrange the subcarriers they assign to certain users. That's the idea. So big advantage is the high flexibility. When it comes to data rates, higher data rate, more subcarriers, lower data rate, fewer subcarriers. High flexibility when it comes to frequencies, you can apply these schemes on a wide range of different frequencies you can even jump into the white spaces. Remember cognitive radius? You try to reuse as a secondary user the white spaces, for example, from analog TV. So OFMA can dynamically jump into these white spaces. But also if you want to have a, a lower uh, error rate, for example, so the quality of service, higher quality of service, lower quality of service, you could rearrange the number of subcarriers. You can rearrange the coding. Great. Very good robustness with respect to fading and interference. So you could actually, depending on how many subcarriers you use, we could jump around narrowband interference. Narrowband interference will simply kill some of the subcarriers, but not all of them. And also the delay, delay before you can access the medium can be way shorter. Why? As soon as there's some spectrum available, you assign subcarriers to a sender. This can be done in a very short time. For other schemes, maybe 
you have to wait until those, this big, big channel is idle. That's what the classical wireless LAN does. This takes some time, but also classical cellular phone systems. It really takes sometimes a lot of time before you can initially access the medium. Here, you can be way faster. That's one part of the answer to the demand of shorter access times, lower delay, low latency, as we call it, in the new mobile phone systems. There are also some disadvantages. Yes, as you can imagine, this is a bit more complex. You need something that's called fast Fourier transform FFT and inverse FFT, but this can be done in VLSI, so specialized chips, need some more forward error correction. So it's a bit more complex because maybe you ask yourself, how do I split up my data stream? And then how do I create subcarriers? So this is all done with the help of FFT without going into details. Please look this up if you're interested. If you use only a few subcarriers, well, you really suffer from frequency selective fading. So in our example, if we have here narrowband interference, this could still kill the blue signal. And if you use this in a cellular system, you have to take care what happens with so-called co-channel interference from neighboring cells. So if you reuse the same subcarriers in neighboring cells, well, you will have interference. To avoid this, you could, for example, go to a different set of subcarriers. So if you have a thousand subcarriers, you could use several hundreds of them in this cell and a other set of hundreds of subcarriers in the neighboring cell. So that was the bit more complex example. But still, we use FDM together with TDM. And now we can also use only TDM. So again, a simple example. Here on the right hand side, we show that a cordless telephone system to replace the classical analog cordless telephones or to replace the fixed telephone system. So high capacity in terms of subscribers per square kilometers, and it works following a very simple TDD TDMA scheme. What does it mean? Here, we separate the direction, the uplink and downlink in time. So we have a certain uplink and a certain downlink phase. Okay. And after this, let's say downlink could follow before this, we have uplink, etc. So we flip between downlink, uplink, downlink, uplink, etc. That's the idea. So TDE, that's time division duplex. Time division duplex. We use this to separate the directions, the uplink and the downlink. By the way, if you find any errors, please send me an email. You will always find some errors in these slides. Okay, time division duplex separate in time using different time periods. And TDMA, we can also separate different channels using different time slots. So for example, channel 11 will appear here in the downlink, but also here at the uplink. Big advantage of this scheme is that you can dynamically adjust how much time you want to spend on the downlink and how much on the uplink. You could, for example, have now, if you think of the slots, here is, I see 12 downlink and 12 uplink, but we could also have something like 12 downlink and only two uplink and again, 12 downlink. Why? Because usually you download more data than you upload. So you can dynamically adjust the data rate you will have in the uplink and then downlink. This is very difficult when it comes to the so-called pad bands. Pad bands, remember, classical GSM, because the spectrum that is available for the downlink is the, basically the same bandwidth you have for the spectrum and the uplink. So same bandwidth, that means same data rate, downlink and uplink. Why does this make sense for GSM? Because this system was designed for voice. And for voice communications, we know 40% of the time 
we send from A to B, 40% of the time we send from B to A, and 20% of the time silence. That's roughly what happens in voice communications. But today we download web pages and tweets and whatever. So we have something like, I don't know, 95% download and 5% upload. So we have a very asymmetric setting. Pad bands, GSM, classical telephone systems, they have a symmetric setting because they assume, well, all people participating in communications, they more or less have this, use the sim same time for talking. This is not always true, but that is an assumption. But here, in computer networks, this is not true. So with a TDD scheme, you can way better adapt to this asymmetric setting. I will explain later how we can do this in LT and all the other schemes. And we separate here, as you see, different channels using different time slots. Okay, so, but please do note, although those two simple examples show the combination TDD, TDMA and FDD, FDMA, other combinations can also make sense, like a TDD, TDMA, FDM scheme, that's exactly what wireless LANs use. They have several channels, so they apply FDM, but they have the up and the down link on the same channel. So that's TDD. So up link and down link on the same channel. So there's no paired band in wireless LANs. But the users, again, are separated in time. Or GSM also applies FDD and TDMA because I showed you inside a channel, well, we separate the users again in time, so-called time slots. I will come back to this in the next chapter. Okay, time for some questions. So think back, what is the main physical reason for the failure of many of the classical Mac schemes? We know from the wired networks. So why do wired networks then work? What is the problem there? And how do we counteract these effects in wired networks? Then what do we need before we can apply FDMA? Who applies FDMA? How does this factor increase complexity compared to TDMA? So think of FDMA, how do we do the FDMA? Who is doing it? And that's exactly the question. Who's responsible for the MAC schemes? Think of the whole frequency spectrum. Who's responsible to split up the spectrum inside a certain part of the spectrum? Who's responsible there, etc., etc. Think back of duplex channels, what are alternatives for implementation? What do we usually use in wired networks, just for comparison, different schemes? Now for the last questions, assume all stations can hear all other stations. So one station wants to transmit and senses the carrier idle. So there's no hidden station. Why can a collision still occur? after the start of the transmission. There are different reasons for this. Some technical reasons and some fundamental reasons. 